Hi, my name is Daria Merwin, and welcome to the Women of Science at the New York State Museum. Here at the museum, I'm an archaeologist and an architectural historian who works with a group called the Cultural Resource Survey Program. We go all over New York State looking for archaeological sites and at interesting buildings, but my specialty as an archaeologist is actually underwater archaeology and maritime history. So I'm so glad that you joined me today to look at some of the shipwrecks of New York State. Before we get to shipwrecks though, I want to talk a little bit about women of science because this would have been our third year doing it here at the museum and um, so many of us here at the museum really love this program. For me, my favorite part of women of science has always been talking with the younger kids and students. So if there are any of their younger audience members out there, this is for you. Here's a question, and I'm sure you get it a lot. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, that's a hard thing to choose when you're in elementary school or younger or older. I didn't know I wanted to be an archaeologist until I was out of college. But maybe a better way to think about these questions about your future are think about the things that you like now. So what about being a scientist? Should you be a scientist? Well, do you like to explore and discover? Well, then yes, you should be a scientist. Do you like to build or create? Yes, you should be a scientist. And do you like to solve problems? Yes, I think you should be a scientist. Well, those are only three questions, but if you see yourself answering yes to any of those questions, think about it. Think about what it would be like to be a scientist. Now, this program's called Women of Science, and we don't want to exclude any young men and boys who might be in the audience today. But why are we talking about women of science? Well, the main reason is that women in scientific fields today, even though we're half the population, we're not fully represented across the board in the STEM fields, the science, technology, engineering, and math. And it seems to me that when you have more diversity, viewpoints and experience, we get a fuller picture of the human experience and learn more. As a maritime archeologist, I have a saying that I'd like to share with you. You may have heard this one before. It's a rising tide lifts all boats. So when we pull women and girls up, it pulls men and boys up too, and we're all in this together. So women of science, how about archeology? span Well, it might not be obvious to you, and it's not always obvious, but to me, archeology span is a science. At its very basic core, it's a social science where we think about humans and human behavior. We explore, observe, and try to understand the similarities and differences between human groups around the planet and through time. Though underwater archaeology as a subdiscipline of archaeology also leans heavily on physics for things like detecting sites and even chemistry for preserving the things we find. So before we get to shipwrecks, I just want to acknowledge some of the women pioneers in underwater archaeology. These are just a handful of the women in the 20th century who really paved the way for people like me to get involved in the field of underwater archaeology. It's Joan Duplat Taylor, Honor Frost, Margaret Rule, and there are plenty of others. So how about today? Well, we are building on the achievements of those women from the last century and learning more about the world every day. So I'd just like to say hi to acknowledge our past and move forward together. So shipwrecks. Wait, why are we talking about shipwrecks? Why do we care about shipwrecks beyond their obviously cool, ooh, look at that discovery factor? Well, underwater and other maritime sites can help us answer some big questions. But you might be looking at this picture here and you might be singing some songs from a movie to yourself. And let me tell you, I'll quote from the character in this movie, we are all voyagers. All humans are descended from voyagers. Our ancestors explored, they explored every corner of the world. They did this by many means. Walking is a good way to explore your world. 
There are other efficient ways of moving around the landscape, especially if you need to carry things. You can work with pack animals, things like dog sleds. But for me, my study, boats and ships. That's how we get about the world. And just as a little point of definition, when I talk about boats, I'm generally talking about smaller vessels. They don't usually have decks and they're not usually sailed. And when I'm talking about ships, I'm thinking of something bigger that usually is sailed. But all together, boats and ships, we can call them watercraft. And watercraft were the means of so much of the early exploration that took, around, took place around our planet. And it's essentially the roots of globalization. Some other cool things about shipwrecks. Ships often represented state-of-the-art technology for their time. So what we're looking at here is a ship called La Belle that was built in the 1680s and was sunk in 1685 in Matagora Bay, Texas. This ship was designed to bring French colonists from Europe to the Gulf of Mexico to the Mississippi River Basin to start a new life. So on this boat, those people carried everything they thought they would need in the new world. They had personal items, um, trade items that they intended to share with local indigenous communities, all the things that go into sailing a ship, and then food, uh, other, other resources, tools, basically contained within the ship was everything that people needed for their daily lives. And in this case, because it's a shipwreck, it was lost catastrophically. We've got something like a time capsule. So we get a snapshot in time that we don't always get on land archeology span sites where things can get reworked and taken away and broken and moved around. Sometimes when we have a shipwreck, we've got that snapshot moment of what life was like at that time. And just as an aside, waterlogged sites, shipwrecks underwater, often have really good preservation. If something is kept continually wet, we find things like wood and bone, leather, textiles, basketry, food remains, things we don't often find on land sites. So it's giving us more information. Now boats and ships had and have many functions besides moving people and things around the world. They're also used for fishing, for making war or defending your territory, communication, even things like ritual and ceremony. People have long thought about boats as a way to transport souls to the underworld. The Maya, the Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, they all shared this in common. So there's a, a different sort of um, cognitive or thought aspect to boats besides their obvious function. Now, watercraft have a very deep antiquity, meaning we know people have been using them for literally tens of thousands of years. And the way we know this is through something called circumstantial evidence. We don't have the direct evidence, but we know the continent of Australia was colonized more than 50,000 years ago. And at that time, people moving to Australia had to cross at least 60 miles of open water to get there. And really the only way to accomplish that is through some sort of watercraft. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the boats themselves that are quite that old. The oldest ones we have right now are about 8,000 years old and they are dugout canoes found in Northwestern Europe. You can sort of see that at the bottom of the slide there. It looks like a plank. That is the remains of a very old boat. Now here in New York, we know similar types of watercraft were used. We've got written accounts and depictions um, from 16th and 17th century European observers, such as this map here. And I, I like this example of a map because New York occupied a not unique, but an interesting place on the Atlantic coast when the European explorers came. It marked a dividing boundary between bark canoes that were used to the north and dugout canoes that were more typical for southern areas. So the first explorers coming into New York Harbor, 1524, that would be Verrazano, made observations of these two different type of watercraft that indigenous people used here. So dugout canoes, 
The museum actually has three dugout canoes in its collections. Unfortunately, these were all gifts to the museum, so not a lot is known about them. They're probably all fairly recent. The best studied one is this one. This is called the Glass Lake Dugout Canoe because it was found in, guess where? Glass Lake in Rensselaer County, which is just across the Hudson River from where we're standing today. This dugout canoe was given to the museum in 1893. It's about 20 feet long. It's made of a single log of eastern white pine, and enough of it was preserved that it could be dated using tree ring dating. And by counting and looking at those tree rings, the scientists determined that this log was felled in about the year 1777. So quite a long time ago. So in New York, where do we find them? Well, pretty much everywhere. NOAA, which is the federal agency, the National Oceanic Administration, Atmospheric Administration, they have counted the shoreline, the coastline of New York State, and they've determined that we have 2,625 miles of coastline here. That's a lot of coastline. We've got great lakes, we've got rivers, we've got inland lakes, we've got towns, we've got oceans, we've got harbors. If you look on Wikipedia, this is the list. That is a major undercount. <laughs> New York has way more shipwrecks than that. <coughs> Excuse me. And where do we find them? We find them in the Great Lakes. That is Lake Ontario with some of the known shipwreck sites. We find them on inland lakes. Those are some in Oneida Lake. We also find them in Long Island Sound in the Atlantic Ocean. So basically, everywhere you look, you find shipwrecks. Besides looking in the water, we can actually find some shipwrecks on land all the way across the strait from the, the state from the far western shore to the far eastern shores. Um, just some newspaper click, clippings to give you an idea. Um, just this spring, Sandy Pond out near Oswego, uh, a rather big portion of a 19th century ship was exposed on the beach and um, a more older find or a slightly older find from Hurricane Sandy back in 2012 exposed a number of wrecks on the beach in the southern part of our state. There have also been a few interesting finds in New York City, Lower Manhattan specifically. Um, so for example, when the subway was being built in Lower Manhattan in 1916, remains of a boat that might be from 1614 were found. Now, unfortunately, we don't have much information about this except a few artifacts that suggest that it could be Dutch and just these pictures. Another example is the Water Street ship that dates from the first decades of the 1700s. More recently, a substantial set of ship hull remains was found at the site of the World Trade Center. Um, we're really excited about this find in particular. The find was made in 2010. A lot of study has been done on this particular site. All those wooden remains, all the timbers, all the planks, all the frames were removed from the site and they're now being conserved at Texas A&M University. And what that means is that they're being preserved for eventual display. And um, here's a little sneak preview. They're coming here to the New York State Museum. So they won't be done for a while. We're hoping by 2024 or 2025, they will be here on display in the New York State Museum. And you could check out this really cool site yourself. So while we're in Lower Manhattan, let's just take a tour up the Hudson River. So here's a bird's eye view. We're standing to the south of Lower Manhattan looking north. The river on your left is the Hudson River. Um, and the reason why we're going to take the trip of the Hudson River is because it's actually a project where I was part of the team um, mapping the bottom of the Hudson River and in doing so finding a bunch of shipwrecks. So the mapping was originally done for environmental purposes. 
Um, it was the first time the river bottom had been mapped from New York Harbor all the way up to Troy since the 1930s. And in doing that, the scientists used something called sonar. And I'll get to that in a moment. But an inadvertent discovery was made, shipwrecks at the bottom of the Hudson River. In the initial study, these things looked like lumps and bumps on the riverbed. And it was clear that they were human made, but not so clear what those things are. So I was part of the team that went back and using equipment better suited for finding shipwrecks, took another look at the bottom of the Hudson River. Now this is where physics comes in. Um, basically what we're doing is we're using sonar or sound waves to sweep across the bottom of the river and the way that those sound waves bounce back, their intensity and their duration, how long it takes for them to bounce back, it will actually give us a picture of what's below. And you can do this in real time. You basically drive over the site of the river you want to study and you get immediate feedback on the computer screens what the sonar is detecting. So we used a bunch of different equipment. This is something called a multi-beam sonar, which instead of just using one sound ping, it uses a whole array. So it gives you a nice three-dimensional image. We also use something called side scan sonar and magnetometer, which will tell us if there's metal there or not, which could be a sign of a shipwreck site because shipwrecks had metal in fastenings like nails and also things like anchors. And you could sort of see where we went with this, the before and after, going from a lump and bump with the equipment that was used in the initial survey to much finer grain resolution of what those shipwrecks look like. And they look marvelous. This was the first time anyone got to see what lies beneath those waters. Now, this is all wonderful and, and terrific and really exciting. These images that were produced are really cool. But the way to really tell what was going on was to send divers down. Now, here's the thing. Diving in the Hudson River is really hard. It is cold. It is dark. There's lots of boat traffic. There can be strong currents. This is not for the faint of heart. This is for a very well-trained team of divers. And in this case, we partnered with folks at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum who are used to cold and dark and horrible conditions and are really top notch at what they do. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that all those terrible conditions that are presented for anybody who wants to see what might be down there has also kept away recreational divers. So folks who might go out and mess around with the wreck, maybe take a souvenir or 10, what this means is that the wrecks at the bottom of the Hudson River represent largely untouched archaeological sites of all kinds of vessels. It's basically an intact museum on the bottom of the river. So our job as archaeologists is to find a way to get that information to you, the public, so you can also understand and appreciate what might be down there. Okay, so I know we're going through all the shipwrecks. Um, I'm just going to give you a, an overview of some of the things we've seen down there. We saw a wide range of boat types, and we know what they are now thanks to the sonar imagery and following up with the divers to verify what we saw in the sonar really is what we think it is. In many cases, the boat types we are seeing are only known through documents, things like paintings, written descriptions, other forms of communication, we don't have any surviving examples of, for example, this very famous boat type called the Hudson River Sloop. They were everyday common boats on the Hudson River. You might have heard of the sloop Clearwater that still sails today. Well, Clearwater is a replica built in the 1960s. At the time when Pete Seeger and others were trying to get that boat together, they first looked to try to find one to fix up. They couldn't find one because they don't exist anymore. So when we found them archeologically, it was super exciting because nobody knew that there are still intact examples. So here's just a few pictures of sailed vessels in Hudson River, including our Hudson River sloop from about 1840. That structure in the middle is called a centerboard. 
That was actually so you could raise and lower the structure that was used as a keel so you could bring this vessel into very shallow areas. Here is another sailed vessel carrying a cargo of bricks. And the slightly later, <coughs> excuse me, example, you think this is a vessel type called a lighter that would have been very common in New York Harbor going out into the deeper areas of the harbor, taking cargo off and then bringing it to shallow areas. This one had a cargo of coal. So those are some sailed vessels. We also have a bunch of canal boats. The mid 19th century in New York was canal crazy, surrounding states as well. Canal boats were as common as you see cars on the road today. Not very many have survived until we found them at the bottom of the Hudson River. So just a couple of examples of what those sonar images look like. Canal boats are basically giant rectangles. They don't need to be really good at sailing because they spend most of their time on canals being towed by things like mules. So they don't have to be really sleek or seaworthy. So when you see these very boxy shapes, you know you've got a canal boat. One set of canal boats we found is tied to a particular wrecking event that happened in April 1885. It's very nice as a researcher when you can find the historic account of something and then line it up with your archaeological site. In this particular disaster near the Tappan Zee Bridge, now the Mario Cuomo Bridge, a storm swept up and ended up sinking 10 boats in one event. And we found a few of them including this really unusual one. This is just an example of the notes that the divers take when they're underwater. And those notes come together to form a sketch plan of the site. And there's the sonar image below it. <coughs> Excuse me, you look at this. And our first thought was, wow, that was a powerful wrecking event. It broke the boat in two. It looks like it's broken. Well, it turns out it's not broken. It's a special type of boat called a Morris Canal boat. The Morris Canal went through mostly New Jersey. What it was designed for was to take coal from coal fields to Pennsylvania and bring them to markets in New York and New Jersey by way of the Hudson River and other waterways. Now, to get between Pennsylvania and New York and New Jersey, there's a lot of elevation changes that happen. And the way the Mars Canal boats took care of this was something called an inclined plane. So the boats were actually built in two part, put on these carts, and then pulled up a hill to get to the next part of the canal. So it was really cool when we found out what that was, that, oh, it all makes sense now. There was no, um, to the divers, there was no obvious destruction of the vessel, so wondering what that broken image looked like and then finding out. And there in my hands is a piece of coal that was on that wreck. And you can see that's a pretty big chunk of coal. So again, we, we think this is associated with that April 1885 storm. Also on these vessels, besides their cargoes and the technology we learn about for shipbuilding, we get a glimpse of everyday life. So example, these are just a few of the artifacts that we found in one particular vessel. That's a glass inkwell, that's a glass lamp on the bottom covered with all sorts of um, growth, but the plate next to it is something called a yellowware plate. These are not fancy items. You would not really expect fancy items on board one of these working boats, but it tells us a little bit about how people in these places lived. And the people who were working on these boats were everyday people that we don't always get to know through history. So getting to know them through their objects is another way to understand their working lives on the river. So I was really happy to be part of a team. Um, underwater archaeology, for the most part, is a team effort. and. I kind of want you to leave with the idea that it's all super exciting and wonderful and there's all these aspects of discovery, but it would be, um, I'd be remiss not to mention there is some parts of it, there are some parts that are not super glamorous. Um, a lot of it is kind of tedious working at your computer a lot of the time. 
Some of the diving is not super wonderful. Um, that's actually a, a picture of a dive project I did in outer New York Harbor, and that was the best day we had in terms of taking pictures on the ocean floor. And underwater archaeology just requires so much stuff. It's more expensive, more gear intensive than land archaeology in terms of comparable projects. Um, but that's sort of the downside. And you might be wondering, well, is it worth it? And my answer is yes, absolutely. Besides the discoveries we make, um, as a scientist who likes to work in a collaborative environment, one of my favorite parts is the mentoring that can take place as well. This is just a screenshot of a, well, a, a photograph of one of the projects that I led. This is the same project um, in outer New York Harbor where I was working on my dissertation research. So I did the field study as a field school where people came from all over the country, students, to learn how to do things. And because we were all young and learning together, it was a very collaborative environment. But I'm really proud to say that most of the people who took our field school have gone on in the field um, here just from left to right. Um, Matt on the left is a PhD student. Amy in the middle has her PhD and is teaching on the West Coast. I got my PhD and then Matt on the right, two Matt's there, he's got a master's degree and is still working in the field as well. So that aspect of solving problems together, figuring things out, how to collect your data in adverse circumstances, um, that teamwork, that mentorship, I really, really enjoy that part of it as well. So that was a very quick tour of shipwrecks in New York, but there is so much more to explore. Definitely check out your local library. Um, there are shipwrecks books for the state, a bunch for Long Island and the Atlantic Ocean. There are some for each of the major lakes as well. I'd urge you to check those out. If you're a diver and anywhere in the eastern part of the state, we do actually have submerged heritage preserves in the state. Right now, they are all in Lake George where the diving tends to be quite nice. Uh, it's cold, but it's clear. And there are a number of really cool archeological sites that you are allowed to go check out. Um, Lake Ontario is in the middle of the process of trying to become a marine, excuse me, a marine sanctuary, a federally recognized marine sanctuary calling out its historic significant wrecks. So maybe in the future, we'll see more of that come online. So there'll be more access to recreational divers who want to check out some really cool sites. So books to explore, sites to explore. And I'll leave you with the question, are you a future trailblazer? Will you be the next underwater archaeologist? I hope so. Um, but there you go. Come with me. Thank you so much for joining us today. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. We did have one question. All right. Um, how is a shipwreck preserved for display, such as the one you mentioned with the World Trade Center? Ooh, that's a good question. I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago, one of the downsides to doing underwater archaeology is that it tends to be expensive. And that definitely extends to preserving the artifacts when you recover artifacts, especially things like wood from a waterlogged environment, you can't just leave it to dry out. It will collapse. It will disappear within a matter of years. So in the case of the World Trade Center ship and most of the larger vessels that have been taken from the seafloor and put on display, they go through something called conservation, where if it was in a saltwater environment, the first step is to get all those salts out but then usually what we need to do for wood is bulk up that wood somehow. And usually the chemical that we use is something called PEG or polyethylene glycol. And you can get that into the wood by spraying it for literally decades, submerging it in a giant tank where the PEG can go into the cell. But again, it takes years and years and years so I mentioned the World Trade Center ship parts. They were excavated in 2010. They first went to Maryland for a little bit where they were documented. Now they're at Texas A&M. They are still in conservation. They've been there a few years. We expect a few more years. It's not unusual for a ship hull that size. And I, if I'm remembering correctly, the length of that 
segment, it's not actually the whole vessel. It's most of it. It's between 30 and 40 feet. It's not unusual to take a decade to slowly impregnate that waterlogged wood with the PEG, the polyethylene glycol, to make it stable once it dries out. So it's a very controlled process. It's a very lengthy process. So you need people, you need um, researchers. Actually, artifact conservation is the reason why I got into underwater archaeology, because everything you recover from an underwater environment is going to need some sort of treatment before you can put it on display in a museum. Great question. Thank you. And one more. Have you had any interaction with the Hudson River Maritime Museum in Kingston? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> They've seen a couple of versions of this talk. Um, I've certainly worked with them. Um, they're a great group down there. They have a fantastic collection of everything from watercraft to the archival documents. So they are a super resource. I don't know if they're opening anytime soon, but certainly check that out. They do have outdoor displays too that hopefully the public can go check out. So yeah, I, I, the Hudson River Maritime Museum in Kingston's an excellent facility. All right. Thank you so much for joining us at Women of Science today. Um, we look forward to seeing you again one of these days. Take care.